Hi. So, this presentation is called Collective Housing, Theory and Practice. Um, so let's start. So here is an outline. I'm going to try to be quick through the boring part. So first thing I'm going to start with is what makes something an organism. Um, and I'm not going to be able to go into this nearly as much as I would like, but it's sort of the, the thing that motivates me for everything else, so I just, I just feel the need to touch on it. Um, then I'm going to do a lit review. I looked at 51 papers on cooperative housing, um, and then we're going to move into the design principles, which will be a review for you folks, but internet. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the current projects that I'm working on. So, start. What makes something an organism? You'd think that that is a, a really sort of simple question. We all know what an organism is. Turns out it's actually not an answered question. Um, so let me tell you a little story. Right? This is, again, this is the, the story that sort of motivates me to, to do all this stuff. Is if you go back about 800 million years, right, and you looked in the, in the oceans, you wouldn't see any sharks or, or dolphins or anything. You'd only see little creatures like this, right? little, little cells, little selves. Right? Each cell is a self. And then, flash forward two or three hundred million years ago, you got the Cambrian explosion, and all of a sudden you have things like this, and much more complicated. You've got Snidarians and trilobites and everything else. So, the point here is that something happened between here and here. We're up here, you've got individual cells out for themselves, and then down here you have a collective unit. This is a ball box, right? So, so a transition occurred. We know this transition occurred. Right? And, and it didn't just occur here, it occurred in lots of other places. Right? So here's a couple more examples. Like, so a lichen is a symbiotic association of a, a fungus and an alga. Right? Then you've got these army ants making a bridge. Right? So, so there are many points on the tree of life where you see groups of organisms coming together to form a larger organism, which doesn't actually get at the answer to this question I posed, what, what is an organism? A difficult question to answer, I'm not going to answer it. But the point is that I'm trying to get forward here is that there, there is a precedent for saying that groups of organisms can come together and form an organism of a higher order. Right? So that idea is, is something that, that really grabs me and, and makes me say, like, okay, so what would it take for a group of humans to come together and to be considered an organism like a lichen? Right? So that's, that's, that's the question that I'm going to frame everything else with. Can't answer it. Um, okay, so literature review. So what I'll say about this is that I was actually pretty disappointed with the literature that I can find. Um, uh, and mostly that's because words like collective house or communal living or cooperative community, they're really, really terribly defined. Um, in that there's, they mean very different things in many different contexts. I have a very particular definition when I talk about like, oh, I live in a collective house. I mean something very specific. But if you type collective house into any of the journals, the thing that you get most frequently is these healthcare retirement homes, right? As you can see here, uh, in, a, in a communal living recovery setting, right? So there's lots and lots of articles about, uh, you know, healthcare and, and nursing homes, basically. But I don't really want to talk about those kinds of homes because they don't, they don't get at that organism question. Like, okay, you have a business and, and there's, there's a bunch of sick people that are being cared for, but it's, it's not really, it doesn't have agency in the way that I would like to say an organism has agency. So that, this is not the kind of thing that I'm interested in, despite its prevalence in the literature. Um, then we also have, you know, I found a few studies on gated communities. Same sort of problem. Like, there, yes, there, you can, there's the word community is there, but they're not really communities in, in the same sense. Um, there was one interesting article here, Shoestring Democracy, which was actually talking about that, how like representation in these gated communities is actually really terrible, that the people who live in them don't know how they govern themselves, and so they govern themselves very poorly. But, um, so because of that, I'm not really interested in gated communities either. Um, oh, right, okay, did that slide. Um, so then there's a, a huge literature on urban planning and policy, which is quite interesting in that lots of, lots of different policy makers saying like, oh, we can get collective houses and this, and how do we, how do we work with the legal frameworks that we have? And it's a, a lot of, there's a lot there. Um, but what I found lacking with all this is it was all very top down. Right? So they weren't concerned with how does a collective house function? Right? How, do, how do we get a bunch of people together and make them work well together? That's not their question. Their question is how do we fit these sort of like more alternative living situations in with a greater urban landscape? So they're interesting questions. Also not the questions that I want to answer. So um, you can see this theme. I'm not, not super happy with the literature that I could find. Um, but you know, some of these are, are very interesting. Um, in a similar vein, uh, let's see, what's next? Oh, architecture. So there was, there was this really interesting paper here. What were they doing? They were using this word urban tissues, right, and adaptability. So there's, there is some, 
some these ideas are floating around that that you can have organisms in 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 these sort of like human societal context. And so there's a lot of like interesting architectural theory about how to design space to to be more conducive to collective living. But there's still this question of like how do you make a collective house work? <laughs> like that that's that's the big question. And and as far as I could tell, there was there was almost no literature on that. Um, so. I mean, okay, there's a little bit. So there's, now I'm going to go and there's all these ethnographies about intentional communities. So what, this one is, um, one of them is Findhorn, and here's, here's an, an eco-village that's right up the road in Ithaca. So there's a number of, of ethnographies on these different communities. And this is getting a little bit closer of what I want to get at, because they're actually looking at these communities and saying, like, okay, what makes them tick? Um, yeah, so, and, and often what you see with intentional communities is they're, they're, they're really focused on farming. Um, yeah, farming and permaculture is, is a huge component of it. And, then, and I guess that also, if I'm going to return back to this organism thesis, is if you have a community that can sustain itself by growing its own food, that's a real, real strong indication that, okay, there's something, there's something interesting going on here. There's something like agency going on here because they are self-sufficient. Um, so here's again being, being wrought by these, these terms, you know, what, what does group living mean? So I got a lot of things that resemble... Uh, Articles about people living together, but not much more than that. So there, there isn't really a cohesive definition of, of collective living that I could find, so I suppose that means I need to advance one. Um, lots of information about Scandinavian cooperatives. and co That was interesting, because like in, in Scandinavia, this, this cooperative thing is much more widespread, uh, so they have a lot more diversity, um, but it sort of lacks a lot of the political angle, which is what I'm going to go through next. This is a lot of blah, 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 blah. Anyway, um, this is what I'm interested in. It's radical space activism. So things about squatting and using urban spaces in alternative ways. And um, I guess in North America, a lot of the, the stuff that is commonplace in Scandinavia has this sort of political angle because it's more illegal here. Um, and, and then finally, we get to urban collective housing. So here there's an ethnography about a, a trans house in Brooklyn. Um, and then here, finally, there's one, one paper that talks about Ostrom. Right? Only one and all that? Only one and all that. <laughs> um, that you know is, is analysis of, of eight eight cooperatives in Germany according to the Austrian design principles. So I'll get to those next, um, and and yeah. So let's let's just go go right into that, right? So well, I'll, I'll I'll just summarize, right? Which is that throughout all this literature, the question that I really wanted to to see an answer to is this one: what what makes a collective house function well? And I couldn't really find a good answer to that. And of course, that's not actually the question I want to ask. The question I really want to ask is, what criteria must a collective house fulfill in order to be considered an organism in a Darwinian sense? Um, but that's, that's far away from here. But we can go back to this first question, this one, what makes a collective house function well? And the best answer that we have for that question that I, I think, I believe, is um, from this one. Right? And so this is all uh, familiar to you. Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009 for her research on governing common pool resources. And, and her, if you're going to summarize the, the books and books and books that she wrote, it would be, it would be these eight, eight things, you know, eight, full, eight noble truths, I suppose. We like lists of, of things. Um, so I'll just run through it really quickly because you are all familiar with it. Right? So the first design principle is strong group identity and understanding of purpose. So if we're going to go back to like, some of those other things that people call communal houses, like a nursing home, right, this is going to be lacking. Right, it's, it's a I mean, I guess there's an identity there, but it's not, not quite the same thing. Um, so number two, proportional fair distribution of costs and benefits. So those that are working the most should be getting the most out of it and, and vice versa. Um, but also equitable distribution of costs and benefits. So it's not, not just that, you know, the, there's, there's equality and there's equity. You need a little bit of both. Um, three, fair and inclusive decision making. So making sure that everybody in the community is, is part of the decision-making practice. So the, the key word here is consensus um, in, in the collective housing world. Um, monitoring of agreed-upon behaviors. In, in small situations like a collective house, that just sort of happens implicitly. Um, but then you also need five graduated sanctions for misbehavior. So you need some way of, of enforcing these norms. Um, six would be fast and fair conflict resolution. That again goes up to three. Um, with this consensus decision making. So in consensus based decision making, it's not just one person, one vote, it's that everybody has to wholeheartedly be behind whatever decision is being made, otherwise it's not going to be made. So it's, it's a, a lot harder to achieve consensus than it is to achieve a majority. Um, 
So number seven and eight, these have to do with, with group level dynamics. So the authority to self-govern in a world filled with other groups. And eight is appropriate relationships with those other groups, meaning that all of these apply on a group level. Right, so that, that's the Ostrom design principles. Um, and now I get to talk about the stuff that is happening in Binghamton. Right, so you all are familiar with this. So this is this platform uh, that uh, David has set up and my lab is working on. And it's an online tool that tries to get these design principles implemented in groups. And this was something that Hernan said in your presentation. Like, there, there's a big difference between having this theory, right? Like, oh, we have these eight things, let's do them. And then, like, actually getting them implemented. Mm -hmm. And so ProSocial is, is one tool among many tools to try to get these, these principles implemented. Or, or just even more broadly, to get groups to work well, which is a surprisingly difficult thing to do. Um, so, here is my group, um, the Genome Collective. And uh, so let's click here and see, see what we can get. Um, so our website will be loading. So the Genome Collective is an urban collective house. So think back to that, that huge list of different kinds of collective I mentioned. So things that, that you know, make me, or hmm, things that qualify the Genome Collective as a collective house for me is this. So we're sharing food, uh, we're sharing resources, and, and we're trying to do something interesting with space, something that, that is you know, not, not normatively accepted in, in New York State as, as a, a way of, of using space effectively. Um, so trying to push the boundaries a little bit on how space can be used and doing so in a way that is more cooperative and more egalitarian. Um, so if I scroll here, we're a community, oh, this scroll doesn't work. Community of people, humans who share their life. oh, that's also just bad formatting. Um, so what does it mean? We eat together every day like you join us for dinner. So here, what is a genome, right? So the, the name genome is, is very deliberate. It goes back to that, the framing that I started this talk with, which is that I'm really interested in this idea that a group of people can be considered an organism. So what is, some, what, what is something that every organism has that we know of is a genome, right? This is this sort of like static crystal thing that informs what the organism is, informs what the dynamics is. And you see lots of cultural precedents for this, you know, like the Torah or the U.S. Constitution. Or there, there, are, there are founding documents that, that inform the more dynamic physical properties of any kind of organization. Um, so, so I think there's a strong link to be made between genetic information and cultural information. But again, that's a semiotic question that is well beyond our scope here. Um, right, so the next thing that I'm going to talk about, if I can go back, is this other really wonderful group that just came to meet with us this weekend that I want to advertise for a little bit called From Point A. So let's take a look at their website. Um, From Point A is an interesting phrase because it's all about getting from here to there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they are a very uh, practically oriented organization. So they, they basically have very, very similar goals to ProSocial. Uh, but they are doing so from less of a theoretical background than, you know, from the evolutionary biology department at Binghamton University. And, and from uh, all, of, all of the members of Point A have lived for, for many years at some rather successful intentional communities. Um, so let's look here. From Point A is working to create a network of ambitious and engaged income-sharing egalitarian urban communes as a starting point on the road to a more humane, satisfying, and sustainable world for all. So if we click on this, right, we can unpack these adjectives. Um, so what do they mean by urban, income sharing, egalitarian, democratic, ambitious, and engaged? And I'm going to focus on this one. Oh, I, I missed it. Income sharing, right? Um, because again, going, going with this organism idea, it would seem that in order for, for a group to be considered a Darwinian organism, it would need to have a, a really, really high level of integration an integration not just philosophically, but also materially. And the way that we talk about materials in this society is with income. So, so you know, one, one conjecture that you could make is that in order for a community to be considered an organism, it needs to be income sharing. Then anything less than that, you would, you would have too many cheating problems, basically. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it's, it, the logic says it might be. Um, so what did we do? Um, I've lost track a little bit from point A. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I can leave that out. I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit. So um, there were four people from point A who came uh, on Thursday and Friday to, to meet with the Genome Collective. And 
basically, I mean, they did a lot of things, but basically they're communication troubleshooters. Uh, because this, this consensus-based decision-making is not a communication style that comes naturally to us as humans. Um, I mean, I suppose it does, but it's just there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in the way from communicating effectively, especially when, when the group size gets large. And we were just four people. And, and despite the fact that we were just four people, there's just like huge, huge problems when you try to like, because we were four uh, people that were unknown to each other. We all moved into this house, and then all of a sudden there's drama. And like, how do you, how do you respond to that? Um, and so, point A came for, they were with us for like 50 hours or something like that, and we um, shared many meals, and then, you know, on Friday we had this like really crazy marathon meeting where we, we spoke for eight hours, and everybody's shit just gets like thrown out into the water, and, um, and it was, it was remarkably effective, like they, they seemed kind of like magicians, or like there's, there's, there's a lot, it, it was very humbling for me to like see, see all of these dynamics going on, and be like, whoa, like I know, like nothing, <laughs> like really, really nothing. Um, but it was it was really, really good. And then the the conclusion of that was got this wonderful email from Paxos, which I've sort of transliterated for you up here, is uh, future directions for for working with them. Um, so one thing is that Point A is affiliated with all of these different communes in Long Island City and ACBC, and I don't I didn't even know what many of these are as well as these two central Virginia communities, Twin Oaks and Acorn, which are uh, very economically successful and have been around for, for almost 50 years. Um, and so one idea is that we can, we can sort of use this pro-social methodology to get data on these communities. And the, and the, and the question that um, Paxis was particularly interested in was this one. Hypothesis, people living in a community have better than average mental health. And I think you... Ian did a study like on that, right? Like, isn't that in, in yeah. his intentional in community? In intentional communities. They yeah. Excellent mental health. Yeah. Um, so then the question is, right, so do people living in community have better mental health because they are self selecting, that mentally healthy people choose this environment? Or is there something about the environment that actually can actively make people healthier? Right? So the conjecture is that yes. These, these communal environments can make people healthier, but you know, we're scientists here, so let's, let's find some proof. And um, that proof shouldn't be terribly difficult to get. Um, and then number three is you know, something I sort of already mentioned, is this best practices exchange, which is that ProSocial is this organization that is designed to figure out how to make groups function better. And point A is also an organization designed to get groups functioning better. So there ought to be a significant amount of overlap in, in methodologies and, and ideas behind those methodologies. Um, yeah, so that was, that was a, a, a breeze through a lot of things. Really I'm good. happy to talk about anything more in, in awesome. more detail than that. Okay, well that's good, thank you. <laughs> just, um, just a couple of questions and then I have just a few minutes to wrap up. So, uh, questions, yes. Is Point A attempting to become affiliated with your um, housing? Um, sort of. just like doing research? So point A is, is, you know, I guess if I'm going to use this organism meta, metaphor further, they might be like the reproductive arm of the FEC. Um, so the FEC is the Federation for Egalitarian Communities. And you can do kind of cool things when you have a, a bunch of money pooled somewhere. And that's what all the investment bankers teach us, right? And so the FEC is this consortium of different income sharing communities. And some of them have been allow, around for long enough that I, I mean, I don't know exactly what their finances look like, but I believe that they, they've amassed enough wealth that they can start thinking about, okay, so how can I, how can we, you know, move this money around to, to make things better? So point A is trying to create or foster the creation of more income sharing communities that would ultimately join the FEC. So the FEC, the, the one thing I know is that they have a, a collective insurance plan. So they, they, have, they have ways, there are some things that are scaled too high or too, of too high a scale for an individual income sharing collective house of 10 members or even an income sharing intentional community of 100 members. Like some things you need a group of groups. So the FEC is trying to create an income sharing network of income sharing communities would be my, yeah, I don't, I don't quite know all the details of it, but that's the point A motive is like get more income sharing communities into existence because then they'll all work better. Yeah. yeah. When you say income uh, sharing communities, are you talking about like everyone has like whatever occupation that they're, they have cur uh, currently and then just kind of um, sharing based on that or was it like they, they like leave like, leave their uh, like current like, st like current like communities and go to this, um, this particular community they're proposing and then have like specific rules of their own? Well, there are many ways to do it, um, and it's sort of a hard transition to make, but 
the general idea is that if you live in an income sharing community, you are doing work, but you are not getting paid. And in exchange, the community takes care of all of the things you need, 100% of them, right? So you don't have to pay any bills of any sort. So in an urban setting, what that would mean is, you know, I have, I have this graduate student job at the university, so whatever money I take in, I pay it all to the Genome Collective, and then the Genome Collective makes sure that I have a room to sleep in, food to eat, and transportation, and any, anything else that, that I might need to live my life. Um, so it's a, it's a way of, of balancing out income unfairness that, that the capitalist world gives us to say, okay, whether you are a professor or a janitor, you're all going to pool your money and you're all going to get the same benefits out of, out of the home that you are a part of. Cults are like this. Cults? <laughs> yeah. uh, cults are like this. I mean, that's like, uh, but, uh, but this is really interesting to contemplate. On the one hand, this seems like so far out that it couldn't possibly work. But on the other hand, we have great examples in cults. And although cults can be, are obviously almost by definition counter-normative, the fact is they're freaking strong social units, right? So if you want to know whether this kind of income pooling thing can work, the answer is, I guess it can, and how well it fits into a larger society is another question. Well, so like, how do you eventually prevent like the stratification that's going to come with the income pooling? Or anything, any large community the best way to organize it, you're definitely going to need some people specialized in things you're good at. So mm -hmm. how do you prevent the stratification that's going to come with it? I don't think you do. Like, I think you want specialization, and you want to have certain amounts of... I mean, yeah, uh, you want that, but there's also going to be... Like, you can't have an egalitarian group that gets to become strato strat stratified. stratified as it is. Size There's size a jillion questions to ask. I'm really sorry to have to cut it short, but I don't want to run over time, and I do have just a couple things to say. So, first of all, thank you, uh, Max. Uh, so very interesting.